Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks to all the organizers for uh, organizing a wonderful conference. It's been a lot of fun. Um, yeah, so I was going to talk about uh, uh, the interaction of statistical physics and deep learning. Mm -hmm. And um, so, you know, as we all know, deep learning has achieved profound empirical success in a whole dom range of domains. Here's an example uh, of uh, um, pattern recognition and machine vision. So here's a complicated deep neural network that takes as inputs pixels and outputs class labels, and it can detect different types of classes of objects, uh, the famous ImageNet network. Uh, so there's a lot of questions about what's going on here. And you know, recently we, we wrote a review article for Annual Reviews of Condensed Matter that should be coming out near the end of this year. We'll, we'll put it up in archive much sooner than that. But, but there's a range of questions like, you know, what can deep networks say that shallow networks cannot? What does the error landscape of deep networks look like? How do we initialize them before we train them? Why and how do they generalize and what controls generalization capabilities? How can we create generative models that can imagine new data? There's a rich sort of set of topics uh, uh, that are open to theoretical analysis, and, and I think statistical mechanics will have a lot to say about it, uh, you know, and, and has already said a lot, as we've reviewed in this, in this article. Um, over the last several years, we've been actually working on a range of topics in deep learning. I can't possibly talk about all of them. Uh, well, the interaction of StatMech and deep learning. But today, I'm going to sort of focus on, on two types of questions. One is, what does a generic deep function look like? You know, what can a deep network really say that a shallow network cannot? And, uh, and how can we uh, exploit this knowledge to speed up the learning curves of deep networks? Right, so, so the first problem we'll look at is expressivity, right? So we're, we're gonna essentially uh, try to show, by, by combining Ramanian geometry, dynamic mean field theory, and free probability theory, we're gonna show that uh, we can derive geometric properties of functions computed by deep networks and show that even a random deep neural network can compute functions that no shallow network can without exponentially more neurons. And then we're gonna use uh, what we learned from here to derive um, really good initializations for deep neural networks that control all the singular values of the, of the input-output Jacobian, the, the matrix that determines um, derivatives of the output with respect to the input, that Jacobian, if you can control all of its singular values and keep them close to one, we can show that we can learn a lot faster. So we have actually practical uh, results in deep learning starting from free probability theory. Okay. So um, the first part, expressivity, was done with a talented group of uh, students and postdocs, some of whom were students with mine and then are now at Google now. Um, and it's these two papers, uh, mostly the first paper I'll talk about here. So um, the question of why depth, right? There's this famous theorem that uh, any network with one hidden layer of neurons can compute any function, all right? So why do we need depth? Well, what these theorems don't tell you is how many hidden neurons you need to compute any given function. It could be quite large. So the basic idea is that there might exist certain special functions that can be computed efficiently using a deep network, where by efficient I mean using a polynomial number of neurons in the input dimension but not by a shallow network unless that shallow network has an exponential number of neurons in the input dimension. Th these ideas have intellectual traditions in Boolean circuit theory. For example, the parity function is such a function for, uh, for Boolean circuits. So people have come up with various examples of such functions for deep networks. For example, if you have the rectify, if you have the ReLU nonlinearity, which is just, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's x for x bigger than zero and zero for x less than zero, so a threshold linear function. A natural measure, well, maybe not a natural, but a measure of complexity is the number of linear regions that a, a deep network could compute, a single neuron in the final layer of a deep network could compute. And they computed a particular, they suggested a particular sawtooth function that you can generate where the number of ridges in the sawtooth is exponential in the depth. And then to compute that with a shallow network, you just can't do it unless you have exponentially many neurons. Uh, there's, there's other results of this form with sum product networks where deep sum product networks can compute polynomials of high degree. Uh, or, or if you expand them, they have exponentially many monomials in them. But if you did it with a shallow network, you can. But these works have some, some concerns with them, which is basically the particular functions exhibited by these prior works, they don't seem natural in any way. And moreover, are such functions rare curiosities? Or is this phenomenon much more generic than the specific example shown so far? Basically, in some sense, is any function computed by a generic deep network not efficiently computable by a shallow network? Uh, 
If so, we'd like to find a theory of, of deep neural expressivity that demonstrates this for one, arbitrary nonlinearities, and two, for perhaps a slightly more natural general measure of functional complexity. Okay, so we'll combine Ramanian geometry and dynamic mean field theory to show that, again, even in generic deep random neural networks, measures of functional curvature can grow exponentially with depth, but not with width. Okay? And, and you can trace the origins of this exponential growth to the theory of chaos. So, for better or for worse, chaos theory is a special case of deep learning. Uh, okay. So, so basically, we're going to be analyzing random neural networks. That's, that's how people initialize neural networks before they train them. They have to choose the weights randomly somehow. So we're going to imagine a, a neural network of this form where these are the weights in a given layer and the biases and, and, and the activity is converted through a nonlinearity to that, the inputs of the next layer. Uh, the weights and biases are IID and Gaussian and the scaling is chosen so that the weights and the biases enter each neuron on an equal footing. Um, okay, so it's a generic IID random Gaussian weights and biases. Uh, you can ask just to understand signal propagation through this network, you can ask a set of basic questions. If you put in two points or two patterns into the first layer, two points in this n-dimensional space, do they become more similar to each other or diverge as they propagate through the neural network? Question number one. And a smooth manifold, how does its curvature and volume change as it propagates through the neural network? So when you work out the equations, the dynamic mean field theory equations for answering this question, you find that there's a phase transition in the behavior of this network. Uh, so this is the phase diagram. This is the variance of the weights, and this is the variance of the biases. And so what happens is if the weights are large, and this is for a sigmoidal saturating nonlinearity, if the weights are large, then you have this chaotic region where nearby input points will diverge. And if the weights are small relative to the biases, you'll have this ordered region where nearby points coalesce as they propagate through the layers of the network. Okay, you can quantify this through a type of Lyapunov exponent, which is, uh, um, so if you think about the Jacobian from the, end, from the inputs to the outputs, that Jacobian becomes a product of Jacobians across all the layers. That's this Jacobian right here. It receives a contribution, of course, from the weights, but it receives a contribution from the nonlinearities, which is a diagonal matrix whose elements are the slope of the nonlinearity. And uh, so there's this quantity chi, which gets raised to the elf power after you propagate through L layers. And so there's this critical boundary in this phase diagram, which is defined by the equation chi equals one. So if you think about backpropagating gradients, what will happen is the chaotic regime, gradients will explode exponentially. The error signals will explode exponentially. And here the error signals will decay exponentially. Along this phase boundary is where gradients will neither explode nor decay. Okay. So, um, and of course, chi is basically like the mean squared singular value of this Jacobian. Okay. All right. So, so now, we, again, we want to show an expressivity result. We want to show that deep, random deep networks can do something that no shallow network can. So to get that expressivity result, we'll, we'll think about something slightly more complicated, which is the propagation of a low dimensional manifold through the neural network. Okay? Um, so how does it behave uh, in the ordered and chaotic regimes? So here's an example of a low dimensional PCA visualization of a very simple circle just a, a one-dimensional ring embedded in a two-dimensional linear subspace within the full n-dimensional space. And this is what happens as it propagates through in the ordered regime. And this is what happens as it propagates through in the chaotic regime. As you can see, it's sort of getting uh, bent and so on. And it looks like the radius of curvature of the circle is decaying exponentially with depth, but that's actually an artifact of trying to visualize a fundamentally high-dimensional phenomenon in a low-dimensional space. To really understand what's going on here, we have to confront the geometry of the circle in the original high-dimensional space. Okay? So we, the way that we can do it is we can just compute the radius of curvature of, of the circle at any given point. So there's something called the osculating circle for any given one-dimensional curve. You can find the osculating circle which has, um, the, the, which has a certain radius and is tangent to the curve here and has the same acceleration as the curve here. And then this radius is by definition the radius of curvature. And the extrinsic curvature is one over the radius of curvature so that large radii mean low curvature. 
Okay? There's an explicit formula for the extrinsic curvature in terms of the velocity and acceleration of the curve at every single point, and we can average the extrinsic curvature over the, over the entire curve uh, to get a formula for it. And also, so just to get an intuition for it, what happens if you just take a circle and scale it up? So imagine you have this single, uh, single circle and you scale it up by a factor of chi. Of course, the length will grow by a factor of square root of chi. The radius will uh, also increase by square root of chi, so the curvature will go down, right? So linear expansion will increase the length but decrease the curvature. It turns out deep neural networks do something very different. Uh, w what we can do is we can write down dynamic mean field theory equations for this new order parameter, curvature. And these are the recursion relations for how the curvature in the previous layer propagates to the curvature in the next layer. So what happens is, so chi, is the expan chi 1 is the expansion factor. Whatever curvature is in the previous layer, let's say the expansion is bigger than 1, or, or it is expansion, so the chi 1 is bigger than 1. Whatever curvature is in the previous layer, it gets attenuated by the expansion, as you'd expect by the linear effect. But new curvature is added in because of chi 2, which is the average second derivative of the nonlinearity averaged over the neurons in a layer. So you add in curvature. So this is like a leaky integrator, right? So eventually the curvature will stabilize to a constant value as the circle propagates forward. But the length will grow exponentially in the chaotic phase. So it's quite easy to understand what's going on. You have this linear expansion and then folding, linear expansion and folding and so on, um, folding by the nonlinearity. And so you can get this exponential um, growth of, of the, sorry, the curvature will stabilize, but the length will grow, so the number of wiggles will grow exponentially, basically. Um, so this is a match. Uh, I won't go into the details of this, but this is a match between theory and experiment for a dynamic mean field three for curvature as a function of the number of layers and numerical simulations. And if, you can't really see the difference between the numerical simulations uh, and the theory, so there's a nice match. So as a result, the circle in a colloquial sense will become space filling as it winds around at a constant rate of curvature to explore many dimensions, okay? So now we can, with that in hand, we can get to our expressivity result. We can ask, if you only had one layer of weights and you asked a circle to propagate through one layer, could you get the same effect? And the, the, the essence of this theorem, which is a worst case result that we proved, is that it doesn't matter how you choose the weights in, uh, of, of this one layer of weights. No matter what you do, the, um, the length of the circle can only grow as fast as the square root of the width, which tells you that the shallow network can't really do um, anything compared to what the deep network can do unless it had exponentially many more neurons. Okay. All right, so just to summarize, um, so we combine Ramanian geometry with dynamical mean field theory to study the emergent deterministic properties of signal propagation through deep nonlinear nets. Uh, we've, we found these analytic recursion relations that, that explain what's going on. Our, our results reveal the existence of an order to chaos phase transition in these feedforward networks, um, and, and that phase transition can uh, allow deep networks to do things that shallow networks can't. So now, can we exploit what we've learned to achieve a practical result? Can we speed up training? Okay. So, um, you know, how does the initialization and the nonlinearities impact learning? And this was joint work done with both people at Stanford and at Google Brain. Okay. And these are the set of these are a, a subset of the papers that are that are related. So, so here's the basic idea. Again, consider the Jacobian, the input-output map. Uh, the matrix of partial derivatives of outputs with respect to inputs. It's this product of random matrices at initialization. Okay? Ideally, when you backpropagate, i.e., if there's a little change that you want to achieve in the output, and you ask, how do I have to change the inputs at any given layer to achieve a certain uh, change here, you apply backpropagation, which is essentially multiplying by this Jacobian, uh, the, the gradients. Right? So clearly, you would want this Jacobian to be well-conditioned at least at initialization. Uh, at least you wouldn't want exponentially exploding or vanishing gradients. Okay. So um, there's this entire curve on the phase boundary right, that doesn't have exponentially vanishing uh, gradients, uh, exponentially exploding or vanishing gradients. But the question is, can we somehow do better than that? 
can we find an optimal point on this curve to initialize? And so what we'd like to do is we'd like to control the entire singular value distribution of the Jacobian. Um, so yeah, again, this is the end-to-end -end Jacobian. It's a product of these matrices. We'd like, we, we, we'd like to, sh we, we, we will show that if you can control the entire distribution to be close to one, you can speed up learning by orders of magnitude, okay? So we were motivated uh, by this in some work that we did early on in trying to understand exact solutions to the nonlinear dynamics of learning in deep linear networks. So even deep linear networks, because of the composition of weights, have nonlinear learning dynamics. And what we found is that if we, um, if we initialize the networks, our exact solutions revealed that if we initialize the networks with random orthogonal weights, then the amount, the learning time to, to learn a particular data set in terms of the number of training epochs or number of gradient evaluations turns out to be actually independent of depth, even as the depth goes to infinity. Okay. On the other hand, if you use the more conventional standard random Gaussian weights, then actually learning time grows with depth and it cannot remain constant. So there's a, there's a different scaling of learning time with depth if you just change the initialization from Gaussian weights to orthogonal weights. Okay, so why might that be? What, what might the intuition be? Well, first, here's the, here's the data. Our, so our, theorem, our theorems actually predicted that, and we didn't believe it, so we did the simulation, and it actually worked out. So this is learning time uh, using random Gaussian weights. It grows with depth. This is learning time using orthogonal initializations, and it remains the same with depth. Why might that be? So if you think about the Jacobian for a deep linear network at initialization, it's just products of random Gaussian matrices. And we know a lot about that, right? So this is a singular value distribution with just one layer of weights, and it's the famous Marcenko-Pasteur distribution. But if you start taking products of random Gaussian matrices, what happens is you develop a, a long tail out here and a large number of singular values close to zero. Okay. Now, again, we initialized all of these cr at, at cr uh, criticality, so the mean squared singular value is 1. All right. So that means, on average, the length of a gradient vector will neither grow nor decay. Right. But the way that this preservation of length occurs is done in a very anisotropic fashion. What's happening is a gradient vector in the output will get projected onto a low-dimensional subspace corresponding to this tail of singular values, and then will get amplified in that subspace. So this non-isometric propagation of gradients uh, you know, my, is correlated with the bad learning rate, right, that, that grows with depth. Um, on the other hand, if you choose um, the weights to be orthogonal, the product of orthogonal matrices remains orthogonal, and every single singular value of an orthogonal matrix is one. So the entire distribution would be a delta function around one, okay? So, um, so what we observe is extremely well-conditioned initializations can dramatically speed up learning, at least in linear nets, but now the question is, does that survive to nonlinear networks, okay? So to actually compute, so, so an open question is, at the time was, how do we design nonlinear networks to achieve what we call this dynamical isometry, where all of the singular values of the end-to-end -end Jacobian of the nonlinear deep network are close to one? Okay, so again, uh, the, the Jacobian is a product of these random matrices, and we can use free probability theory to compute uh, the singular value spectrum of the product. So there's something known as an S-transform, where if you have an ensemble of random matrices where you know the singular value distributions, you can compute their S-transform, compute their product, and then perform an inverse S-transform to get the singular value distribution of the product. And then we can iterate this multiple times uh, for arbitrary depth, okay? So that's the, that's the basic technology. And so what we find is that, um, wh what we find is in the linear case, um, what I've already shown you in pictures is that you develop a long tail where the largest singular value grows linearly with depth, even if you crit initialize things at criticality, and the fraction of singular values within some epsilon range of one uh, becomes vanishingly small with depth, okay? But with orthogonal, everything's one. So that's what I showed you already. If you use the rectified linear units, uh, it doesn't change what happens with Gaussian scaling, and orthogonal weights do not rescue it. Um, you, you still get the same scaling. Uh, 
If you have these sigmoidal networks, then uh, of course with a Gaussian you, you can't do anything. But with orthogonal initializations, you can actually rescue it. So what worked for the, the linear network survives for sigmoidal networks, and more generally for any networks with a nonlinearity, um, you know, is differential but the, differentiable at the origin. Okay? So the ReLU destroys the dynamical isometry of orthogonal linear networks, but the sigmoid does not. Okay? So, um, so for example, uh, yeah, here's another example of a linear network with Gaussian weights, the distribution of single values growing with the tail. This is an example of ReLU networks. Uh, the ReLU network uh, breaks space in half because of the, the threshold linear effect. So this is the distribution of singular values after three layers in a ReLU network. But then after many, many layers, uh, after 10 layers, for example, it, it again develops this tail and develops this inconditioned anisotropic uh, nature of propagation of error signals. Um, this is a sigmoidal network with 100 layers. Uh, this is at a critical gain of one, and you see that the distribution is, is well conditioned. Okay. All right, so um, yeah, this is again summarizing various distributions. So now um, the theoretical prediction then would be that sigmoidal networks with orthogonal weights can learn faster than ReLU networks either with orthogonal weights or with Gaussian weights. And so we actually tested this. Uh, we, we, we trained deep neural networks for classifying images on the, on the CIFAR-10 data set. And the blue is the orthogonal networks with tan H initialization. So the blue is the one th that's predicted to be fastest. This is the test accuracy, so higher is better. And this is the learning time. This is measured in log units. Uh, so you can see that the blue, the solid blue, is on top of everything else for four different learning rules, SGD, SGD with momentum, Adam, and RMS prop. Um, so it's a robust effect across various learning rules, just changing the nonlinearity from ReLU to tan H and the initialization from Gaussian to orthogonal gets you much faster learning. Um, OK. so. We find another interesting, so in the linear networks, learning time scaled as order one with depth, uh, if you have orthogonal uh, initializations. Here, what we found is that the learning time in nonlinear sigmoidal networks scales as a square root of depth. And we actually don't have a theoretical explanation for that uh, um, at the moment. But it is sublinear in depth, which is quite surprising. Um, so as Daniel mentioned, the, there's a role for theory here, because there's something that's surprising that shouldn't be if we had the right theory. Okay. okay, so again, just to summarize this, there's an order to chaos transition that governs the dynamics of random deep networks, uh, often used in initialization. Not all networks at the edge of this order chaos transition are the same. All of them do have neither vanishing nor exploding gradients, but they're not created equal. Some are better than others in terms of learning speed. It turns out the extra information you need to control is just not the mean squared singular value, but the entire distribution of Jacobian singular values. And we use free probability theory uh, um, to compute this distribution as a function of the nonlinearity, the weight initialization, and so forth. And we've, we were able to use such analytic calculations to design networks that have these dynamically asymmetric initializations, and they actually perform better. Um, so it's always really. Uh, nice when, when theory leads to improvements in practice. Uh, okay, so um, again, this is the set of papers that I kind of roughly covered today. All right, thanks. Thank you very much. Um, please. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that the shallow network works. Yeah. So in principle, the minima exist in the loss function, but they are difficult to find. Yes, yeah. But isn't it also, besides the kind of function in the domain, there's also a matter of. Uh, yeah, d definitely, yeah. So whether or not a deep network actually works at the end of the day is a complicated coupled function of the architecture, the learning rule, 
and everything. It all fit, has to fit together to get it to work. And so what Ricardo is referring to is you can train a deep network, a large deep network, on a problem, get a good result, and then use internal information in that large deep network to train a much smaller deep network, and that smaller deep network will work. But you can't directly train the smaller deep network, and that may have to do with having more space to move around in under the optimization. Um, I don't think the expressivity results explain everything as to what's going on because it doesn't address, address learnability. Um, but anyways. Other questions? If not, thank you again. Thanks. Our next